Thank you for joining us for the fourth grade task of the Arts and Development Public Webinar. Before of diving in, we ask you're all muted and hear us. Today we'll feature a PowerPoint presentation and a short video. Please note you will not be able to hear the video's audio via the phone dial in. We encourage you to listen to the webinar, or at least the video. Following the presentations, we'll have a Q&A session. Throughout this webinar, you can submit questions or comments at any time using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We will do our best to address as many as possible during the time we have. Please do not use the raise hand. This webinar will be posted on our website in the podcasts, webcasts, and webinars section of the NEA website in a few days, so you can refer to it. In the and finally, today's webinar will also be live tweeted. Join the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag NEA Task Force. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Sunil Iyengar, Director of the Office of Research and Analysis at the Endowment for the Arts, and Chair of the Interagency Task Force on the Arts and Human Development, a body comprised of 14 federal agencies, departments, or divisions across government that together aspire to catalyze research opportunities and information sharing to advance public knowledge about the arts' role in human development. Throughout the past year, a signal initiative of the task force has been to host quarterly webinars that share examples of research and evidence-based programs on this topic across participating federal agencies. So far, we've heard from the National Science Foundation, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the Institute of Museum and Library. This is our last webinar of the fiscal year, and we thought it fitting to end with a presentation from the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Innovation and Improvement. Jim Shelton, director of that office, is an official member of our task force, represented also by Edith Harvey. So today you'll hear from Jerry Kyle at the Department of Ed, who will, um, who will be talking about the program to be featured in today's presentation, the Arts and Education Model Development and Dissemination Grants Program. You'll be followed by a panel from a grantee organization, the New York City-based uh, Center for Arts Education, Lori Sherman, Jerry James and Doug Israel uh, from the center, and finally a school principal from the Bronx who has been deeply affected by the program. We'll then open it up for questions. We have a full plate, so I'll keep my update brief. Uh, regarding recent task force activities, we achieved a milestone on Friday with the successful convening of a public workshop sponsored by the NEA and three entities from the National Institute of Health and hosted by the National Academy of Sciences. The workshop sought to identify research gaps and opportunities for exploring the arts relationship to health and well-being in older Americans. A report from this workshop will be released within a couple of months, and five commissioned papers duly posted. In addition, an archived video of the event will be made available through the NEA website. Second, as reported last time, other task force members have been working on refining a preliminary literature review of the arts and human development specifically in answer to questions that might be posed by National Institutes of Health researchers. The aim is to understand more fully what has been done over the past couple of decades in this area and what potential openings for investment are suggested by the review. This work product, too, will be publicly available and ready, likely next year. Last but not least, we are moving ahead rapidly with our next public webinar to, our next public webinar to kick off the fiscal year 2013 series. And I ask you to save the date. October 4th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, when we will be discussing a specific research funding opportunity recently made available by the National Institutes of Health and highly relevant to arts research. With that, let me invite you to contact us with any questions at this email address or to visit our website for more um, information about the task force or to view any archived events online. Thank you. I'd like to turn it over now to Jerry Kyle, Management and Program Analyst at the Department of Education. Jerry? Good afternoon. Today we will be introducing the Arts and Education Model Development and Dissemination Grant Program, which is also known as AEMD. AEMDD is a discretionary grant program which funds diverse programs that undergo rigorous evaluation, have an arts focused, multi model approach in learning. In Theater arts, media, dance and creative movement, visual arts including folk arts, and music. 
who is eligible, one or more local education agencies, or LEA, including charter schools that are considered LEA, or one or more state or local nonprofit or governmental arts organizations that must work in partnership with one or more LEAs. The purpose of the AEMDB is to support the further development, documentation, evaluation, and dissemination of innovative, cohesive models that have been demonstrated their effectiveness. One, integrating standards-based arts education into the core elementary and middle school curricula. Two, strengthening art instruction in these grades. And third, improving students' academic performance including their skills in creating, performing, and responding to the arts. AEMDD is a discretionary grant program that funds diverse programs that undergo rigorous evaluation and have an arts-focused, multi-model approach to teaching and learning. You may have noticed Some general findings, we had increased student achievement in the visual arts, music, theater, dance, and movement, increased student knowledge of artistic concepts, improved student self-concept and positive, meaningful relations among students, students becoming active learners and interested in trying new learning methods, and a greater understanding of arts integration by the treatment group teachers over the control group self-reported. I am pleased to turn the microphone over to one of our grantees, Lori Sherman, who is with the Center for Arts Education in New York City. Lori and her team will discuss several AEMDD programs that have been funded by the U.S. Department of Education, plus additional data they have collected. Lori? Thank you, Sunil and Jerry, and thank you to everyone joining us today. The Center for Arts Education is dedicated to ensuring that all New York City public students, school students, have quality arts learning as an essential part of their pre-K through 12 education. We provide school-based residencies and diverse art forms, lead professional development workshops for school leaders, classroom teachers, and teaching artists, and we conduct research, we advocate, and we educate the public on the benefits of arts education. In New York City, where we are based, there are over 1,700 public schools and 1.1 million public school students. Over 41% of these young people report speaking the language other than English at home, and a vast majority live at or near the poverty level. Far too often, it is these students that do not receive an education that includes the arts. CA's programs and initiatives are based on the belief that beyond having great value in and of themselves, the arts promote the health and well-being of our children. Academic and personal growth, critical thinking, and analytical skill development, and the motivation to stay in school and excel. And that is what we have found in our research on the arts and high school graduation rates, and what we see every day in the schools where we work. The arts engage students and help transform schools. CAE's School Art Support Initiative, SASE, is a USDOE AEMDD research grant program that shows promising results. SASE looks at what happens to schools, students, and teachers when quality arts programming is infused into the school culture and curriculum. While my colleagues will share research results and data, I will share a story about one of our SASE schools. At MS57, a middle school in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, the principal did not want to join the program when we approached her four years ago. Her school was under registration review. Her concern was school closure, and her focus was on raising test scores. After dealing with a sixth grader bringing a weapon into the school and several incidents of her own students losing their lives or loved ones to gun violence, she knew she had to do something different. She just wasn't sure what it was. But since we were standing there knocking at her door, she decided to take a chance on the arts. Today, MS57 is transformed, 
and the principal and the teachers will say the arts were the catalyst. I'm happy to share that the school is off the registration review or closure list, and the arts are now a valued and respected component of every school day. Teachers are integrating the arts into their curriculum, students are studying many art forms, and they are prepared with audition materials and portfolios to apply to arts-focused high schools, all opportunities that did not exist in this school four years ago. And every year they produce a musical. The first year was trying, but there were glimmers of possibility. Now, four years later, the entire school community comes together around the musical. Kids can be found running lines with administrative staff, classroom teachers are building sets, and parents are helping with costumes. The students are respectful and engaged audience members. And neighborhood elementary school students are invited to attend the performances. The school is seen as an arts-rich environment, and kids from the neighborhood are applying because of this. Today, the principal, Celeste Douglas, is an arts education advocate because she has seen the change in her school and her kids. She fights every day to hold on to her art teachers, to provide art classes, and to make sure her kids have arts experiences similar to those that wealthier or private schools provide. She fights for equity, her kids, and the arts, as do all of us at CAE. It is now my pleasure to turn this over to my colleagues, Doug Israel, Dr. Jerry James, an arts education advocate and principal of Sassy School, MS223, Ramon Gonzalez. Doug? Thank you, Lori, and thank you to everyone who is participating for giving us the opportunity to share our work with you today. As Lori mentioned, I'm Doug Israel, CAE's Director of Research and Policy. In addition to research and reporting, I also direct our work at the local, federal, and state level with elected officials, education decision makers, and even parents to advance policies that support arts education in public schools. The most significant piece of work that we've published in recent years that has helped make the case for the value of arts education was our 2009 report that looked at the relationship between arts education and graduation rates in New York City high schools. The report was important, I think, in that it helped establish a discussion on one of the many benefits of arts education that is critical to student success, but previously had very little research devoted to it. In fact, while there's a body of research that has established the positive impact that the arts have on a number of education-related outcomes, there's certainly more research needed in all these areas. Briefly, before we get into the graduation report, in terms of framing that report and the discussion of our research from the field, I thought I would quickly mention some of the research-based evidence on the impact of the arts and student development that already exists. Many of the important studies and evidence are cited in recent reports from the U.S. Department of Education, the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities, as well as two recent reports from the National Endowment for the Arts. One other report worth mentioning commonly called critical links, contains findings from a multiple, multitude of independent studies that highlight the academic, social, and emotional impact of the arts on students. If you're interested in surveying the field of research, this would be a really great place to start. As we look at the slide of research-based outcomes, I think it's important to note up front that while the evidence does not necessarily infer causality, it does point to a strong relationship between arts education and a multitude of student outcomes. Many of these you will see evidence in the research projects that Dr. James will share shortly. One of the, the more developed study areas uh, involves research into the impact of arts learning on literacy development. Young children who engage in dramatic enactments of stories and text, for instance, improve their reading comprehension and their oral communication. And this is an especially important area of work as the percentage of English language learners is growing in many communities across the country. And the academic benefits go well beyond literacy development and include a pronounced impact of music on math skills, as well as an ability to help students develop general learning and listening abilities. Studies also show that students who participate in the arts are more likely to participate in school and out of school in clubs and organizations, or even run for elected office at school, creating habits that then lead to greater civic engagement as adults. But perhaps one of the more apropos benefits um, to the education conversation today is the impact on college and career readiness. Not only do students who study the arts do better on SATs, but they develop the critical and innovative thinking skills that CEOs are looking for in today's employees. Unfortunately, we know from recent surveys 
that employers in high tech and other areas increasingly report that they cannot find the skilled workers that they're looking for, and they're focusing their recruitment efforts overseas. Uh, the final outcome area mentioned on the slide uh, is in the area of school engagement, which segues into our graduation report, which builds on a small but growing body of evidence that the arts can be one factor in helping reduce absenteeism and school dropouts. And this is critical because none of the other school-based learning can happen if students are not showing up to school each day ready to learn. So our report, Staying in School, is the first ever system-wide look at arts education and graduation rates here in New York City and nationally as well. The work is relevant in light of the graduation crisis taking place in America today, but also because New York City, which struggles with low graduation rates, is the largest school district in the nation. The report's based on data collected by the New York City Department of Education from over 200 city high schools over a two-year time span. And we looked at the relationship between graduation rates and nine key indicators which are fundamental measures of a school's ability to provide quality arts education. The indicators can generally be divided into two categories, resources that support arts education and student access or participation in the arts. And as you'll see from the slide, we looked at everything from the number of full-time certified arts teachers, the number of classrooms dedicated to the arts at each school, the number of partnerships schools had with cultural institutions, provide direct arts programming for students. And we also looked at the availability and completion rate of coursework in the arts, and whether or not schools are providing students with opportunities to participate in school plays or concerts, or to go on arts-related field trips, such as visits to museums or to Broadway shows. Um, and what we found here in New York City is that students in, um, at high schools in the top third of graduation rates these are schools where more than 75% of the students were graduating on time. Those students had the most opportunities to participate in the arts, and they attended schools that dedicated the most resources to arts instruction. And this, we found, was consistent across all nine of our indicators. As but one example, as you can see on the slide, the top schools had 40% more certified arts teachers per student. And this amounted to, on average, one additional art teacher per school which really can significantly impact what students are being offered. Conversely, what we found is that schools with the lowest graduation rates, uh, those were less than 58% were graduating on time, those students really had the least opportunity to participate in arts learning. And while, while these findings don't necessarily prove causation, they do make clear that principals at the city's top schools understand that the value of the arts, and they're making sure that they're an integral part of the school day. And the findings also speak, and this is important, they also speak to the inequity in the public school system and really a tremendous missed opportunity. Schools that are struggling to keep students engaged and on track to graduate, uh, students at those schools are not being provided with the same opportunities that their peers are receiving at other schools. And quite frankly, these students are being shortchanged. And it's in, the, it's in these struggling schools where the arts really potentially could have the greatest impact. So the report uh, also had a series of policy recommendations that I'm not going to go into here, but I'm pleased to report that um, several of these have been or are in the process of, of being implemented here in, in New York City. Um, so I'd like now to turn the discussion over to Dr. Jerry James, our Director of Teaching and Learning. He's been directing the work that we do in the field, uh, most specifically our School Art Support Initiative, which addresses many of the shortcomings that we see in the struggling schools as that was highlighted in our graduation report. Jerry? Thanks, Doug. I'm going to talk about three AEMDD research projects that underscore the positive impact of arts education on students, on teachers, and on school leaders. Two of the studies took place here in New York City and one in Chicago. I'll start with a study of English language learners conducted by Rob Horowitz and Elizabeth Bo Brun at Arts Connection. Uh, the data was collected from studies covering seven years, literally hundreds of observations, and as the slide illustrates, artist residencies, in this case in dance and theater, develop social, emotional, and cognitive skills. What I especially like about this research is that it highlights how human capacities, such as intrinsic motivation, concentration, and cooperation, develop over time. 
Now, artist residencies are often brief and discreet experiences that expose students to a particular art form or artwork. This study, however, reminds us that rich and challenging arts experiences have cumulative effects. Findings such as these are consistent with what we've learned at CAE. Arts experiences have intrinsic value. Arts and language development go hand in hand. And sequential arts learning deserves much more attention than it usually receives in schools. Now let me turn to the Chicago Arts Partnership for Education, or CAPE, which is well known for its research efforts. I'll focus on one AEMDD project in particular, the Partnership for Arts Integration, or PAIR. This four-year study by Larry Scripp and Laura Paradis examined the impact of arts integration on students and teachers in arts magnet schools. Building on established arts curricula, researchers were able to investigate extended, in-depth work across disciplines, such as math and dance and language arts and visual arts. The researchers described this type of learning as arts plus arts integration. And by this, they mean interactions between the arts and other content areas, not one subject simply informing the other, as is often the case in arts integration models. With regard to academic performance, we know that magnet schools, in general, tend to do better than other schools. It's noteworthy that in this study, arts plus arts integration schools outperformed other arts magnet schools. Interestingly, portfolio conferences served as both a teaching method and as a research instrument during the investigation. In other words, routinely reflecting on arts and academic work helps students and teachers alike discover and articulate new connections across disciplines. To give a quick example, both math and dance can be understood in terms of fractions. What happened over the course of the study is that, one, students got better at reflecting, and two, arts and academic skills improved more or less in tandem, which is further evidence of the interaction, interactions the researchers described. Another compelling result of this work is that students' capacities for critical reflection proved to be the most precise predictor of future academic success. This reminds me of seminal research on creativity by Wallace and Gruber. They discovered that creative people are often successful in more than one area, sometimes in several areas at once. The pair researchers also found that the most profound impact of the treatment was on low-performing students, literally closing the achievement gap in those cases. I don't think this equity aspect of arts education can be overstated. Quality arts education supports students' overall development, in this study, especially those who needed the most support. At CAE, we believe the most effective artist residencies actively involve classroom teachers. So I'm glad that the PEAR study also examined teacher involvement and improvement. As shown, there was a cumulative effect on teacher practice, in part, I suspect, because documenting and discussing work with students developed teachers' reflective practice. And as you can see, as you can see, <clears throat> there was a cumulative, as I said, there was a cumulative effect on teacher practice. And as you can see, the study also highlights the rewards of longer arts initiatives and whole school involvement, what they call the laboratory effect. This leads me to CAE's School Arts Support Initiative, or SASI. Over a four-year period, our AEMDD project helped schools acquire cultural partnerships artist residencies, and related professional development. We also provided coaches to help school leaders realize their visions of an arts-rich school. CAE helps schools set goals and objectives, designate a school-based arts liaison, and form a school arts team. The overall goal was to turn schools that offered little or no arts programming into arts-rich communities. More than the other studies I've talked about today, SASE was conceived to be a comprehensive approach to arts education capable of driving whole school transformation. In terms of students' social and emotional development, we found increased attendance and decreased behavioral problems. We also saw academic scores go up, as you can see, both ELA and math scores by a significant amount. And in terms of artistic development, we found students learning specific artisanal skills, such as being able to create, perform, and exhibit unique work. And as a result, more students are applying and being admitted to arts high schools, opportunities out of reach only four years ago. In fact, few students even knew that such opportunities existed, which of course points to the equity issues Doug and Lori have discussed.
Finally, we documented how infusing the arts changed each school's culture. We saw better teaching, more collaboration, better learning environments, and as Lori noted, a new kind of leadership intent on putting the arts front and center. It makes sense, of course, that quality arts education needs support from school leaders. That's why CAE offers uh, principals institutes like the ones you see here. I'm going to turn it over to Ramon Gonzalez, principal at Stassi School, MSP23. By the way, that's Ramon at the table on the right, seated next to Celeste, the wonderful Stassi principal that Lori spoke about earlier. By the way, Ramon is a White House recognized champion of change and a good guy. Ramon? Hi, everyone, and welcome from the South Bronx. And thank you for allowing me to speak uh, today. I've been working with the Center for Arts Education for about eight years. Um, ten years ago, we were created as a replacement school for what was considered the most dangerous middle school in New York City. And since that time, we've been through an amazing transformation. And I believe that transformation is directly linked to our work with the Center for Arts Education and the focus on the arts. And I want to tell you a little bit about our school and some of that transformation. Um, we, were, we are a school of about 500 students. Uh, three quarters of our students are Hispanic, and one quarter of our students are African American. Uh, Twenty percent of our students are special ed, and uh, fifteen percent are L's. And as you see, ninety-six percent of our kids are uh, Title I students. And I always joke that that four percent is probably error. Um, Ten years ago, when you looked at our school, we had an eighty-six percent attendance rate. Today, our attendance rate is at ninety-five percent, and the top in our area. Ten years ago, when you looked at our school, we had 15 violent incidents per year. There hasn't been an incident in our school in the last three years. Um, we're currently located in the, in the 40th Precinct area, which is one of the most violent um, areas in New York City. But rarely are, are, are any incidents ever reported in our area anymore. And I think, again, that has to do with our uh, relationship um, with Center for Arts Education and really putting a focus on the arts. And just for those who like test scores, 10% of our kids uh, were reading on level in ELA, and 10% were reading on math when we started our school 10 years ago. And today, we have 42% of our kids reading on ELA and 70% on level in math. So if you look at that kind of change, uh, you would wonder if it was many other things. But I, again, I like to say one of those major things was our uh, focus on the arts. And I believe part of that was building my skills as a school leader to really address the arts as every other subject is addressed in the school. And I think as a school leader, we, the center really helped me focus on three areas. And one of those areas was becoming an educated consumer. And what that meant was really looking at school programming. At the time, um, when I uh, took over the school, the typical model in the area uh, was that 10% of the kids were served uh, taking the arts. And as the school system started cutting uh, its budget, there was even less and less arts in our school. I can tell you today, every kid takes at least three art classes in our school, which is far above any other school in the area. Um, and another piece of that is the reason for that change had to, uh, was due to our ability to select better models and really to hold our arts partners accountable to the work we were expecting. The second area was finding resources and managing budgets. Again, with all the cuts in New York City, you would expect art programs in New York City to be cut as well. But through the advocacy from, from the Center of Arts Education and teaching me how to go out and raise money and look at foundations, uh, two weeks ago, we just did an unveiling of a brand new auditorium. Um, we've put in uh, double the programming uh, over the last two years in the arts. And we just had every single kid in our school visit three Broadway shows this summer. Um, that was all due through private fundraising and moving resources in the school budget, and, and frankly, making arts a priority. And in the final area of school leader, a school leader, setting high standards for the arts was crucial. And it was this movement that we had to do, and I had to do personally, from having arts or in terms of quantity to quality. And that meant conducting walkthroughs in the art with the same rigor that I conduct classroom walkthroughs. Networking and visiting other schools. Most principals usually will go to other schools and look at ELA and math. We, the center helped us look at arts. Um, and then finally, planning school retreats and making sure that our teachers had the skills 
to begin some of this reform. And one of the areas we, we really wanted to focus on was aligning uh, Common Core uh, with the arts program as well as the classroom program. And so that started to affect our teacher development and our school transformation. And so the two critical areas we looked at were critical thinking and problem solving. And so by infusing that in all subjects and, and the arts, it became a common practice within the school. We also started looking at expanding teacher um, skills. And the way we did that was use some of the techniques we used in the arts program through visualization, using music and role playing. Teachers learned various ways to integrate their methodologies with current methodologies. Um, and really to try to address those students who are um, having problems engaging uh, in the curriculum, especially our L's and our special needs students. We also found ways to increase collaboration through art retreats where we had biweekly meetings um, as well, where we had our co-teacher uh, and the art teacher would talk every week and plan their programs. And art teachers were expect to, expected to share their lesson plans with classroom teachers. Um, in terms of family involvement, uh, a typical example would be our band playing uh, for our parent-teacher conference um, and parents walking around and seeing their kids playing as well as talking with teachers. We really want to change the environment for our parents. And that changed our stats from 5% uh, who attended uh, our normal parent meetings to 30%. And for our parent-teacher conference, we typically had 50% initially. We're now up to 85% of our parents attend our conference. Um, and in terms of physical setting, through that fundraising and through getting teachers to help us write our grants, we have a new auditorium this year. We have a new library that's going to open up in two months. Uh, we're organizing a film festival, and we've already started uh, relationships with our local CBOs, um, something that we often didn't do in the past. In terms of um, arts and student development, I would say that one of the unique things about the arts, it's an, it's an environment where failure is okay. And that's something that's not often preached in our other subjects. Um, our best art students tend to be our exceptional students. Um, and it's fascinating to see the sex, uh, success of those students in different environments who often struggle academically. Um, and finally, arts has allowed us to do various kinds of, of therapy as well as mentoring programs. So the use of, of arts in our school has changed our school dramatically. And I think it's allowed us to give voice to a large uh, a segment of our population that often isn't allowed to speak. Um, one thing, uh, the implications that we've seen over this time uh, in terms of our school is that we've moved from uh, traditionally schools in our area had about a 75% graduation rate to a 99% graduating rate from middle school um, to the point where the city has allowed us now to create a high school and extend our middle school. Um, and through the work with the Center of, of Art Education, uh, we have one of the highest ratings uh, on our public school survey for both our parents, teachers, and students in the area. In terms of looking at student outcomes, besides having higher test scores and lower incident reports, um, we have more and more students who apply to our school. And this year, we had 1,200 students apply to our school for 150 spots. And it's important to understand there is absolutely no screening in the school. It is a neighborhood school. And often, you don't get to talk about neighborhood schools in the South Bronx in that way. And strengthening school leadership, um, through the SASE grant, I was a school that actually received services. Now I get to mentor other principals for those services. And I think what you see is the spreading out of those skills and impacting other skills. I think that's the best money uh, that could be used. And finally, impacting schools in turnaround. I think that our reduction in incident rates, um, our test scores and our surveys um, on, um, through parents and teachers on the success of our school is probably the best way to show that arts can impact schools. And given the right partners like the Center for Arts Education and through, our, and through our parents and other community organizations, I believe that school change is possible and a great, way to, a great place to look at is how to leverage the arts in your school. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramon, and thank you all our panelists. Uh, before we go into some Q&A, uh, we're you're going to see now a seven-minute video from the Department of Education on its AEM grant program. Impact.
Arts and Education Models Development and Dissemination and Professional Development for Arts Educators have been supporting arts integration projects for K-12 students and teachers across the country. Over the life of two programs, thousands of students have participated in arts integration activities. The project personnel of some of our current grants were asked to share how their projects have benefited students and teachers. Here's their story. So students who are learning in and through the arts have found a new way to express their knowledge to other people and they're able to, to show their abilities in areas that they haven't been able to show before. Stories that teachers tell us, how some of the children that they've never heard speak before in a classroom start talking, and I think that's one of the key things. But, you know, most of our strategies are really all about getting engagement around higher order thinking and around the literature that they're using in the classrooms. Marlene, is it daytime or nighttime? What do you think? You think it's daytime? Why do you think it's daytime? Because it's white. Because it's white, it's light. Our AMDD and professional development projects have helped them to increase their literacy. We've noticed significant gains in test scores among young people who have been part of our programs. We've also noticed increased enthusiasm and engagement, and our evaluators throughout our three um, AMDD projects have consistently found that our young people are more involved in learning, um, use better vocabulary, um, speak more in class, and several other indicators that indicate um, engagement than a comparison group. Name that polygon. Oh. Raise your hand. Jensen. Got it. Engaged in learning. Flat out. We have students that are excited about learning in a way that they never were before. We have students who felt marginalized, and now they feel important. They feel proud. They feel like they have something to contribute, and they have a way of showing they're successful, showing what they know. Well, what we found is when we do professional development, it's always about teaching or giving strategies to teachers to help them learn new ideas and new ways to integrate the arts. And we have found that the teachers love that. So frequently what will happen is we'll do a professional development activity and within the next week we'll see that as evidence in the classroom. We'll see displays in the hallway, we'll hear kids singing new songs, and these are all directly related to what we do in community that told them you were nervous. So you have to, you can't just say, I'm nervous. You have to show you're nervous. I think over the years, we've noticed that teachers really start to build a relationship, a collaborative relationship with the teaching artist that they work with. Um, and in building that relationship, they start to respect each other's professions and they start to understand the benefits of having both of them in the classroom. We've given them an opportunity to share with one another uh, from city to city. Um, this is an opportunity that most of the students that we work with living in urban communities would never have a chance to do. We're engaged in the development of literacy and the development of writing. Uh, with the students. Yeah. And they also become 
seen slightly differently within the community of their school. Um, as you can imagine with um, coaches that are beloved within schools for sports teams, they become the teachers who are the poetry teachers and who carry on the tradition within the school over these years and are looked up to in that way and are sought out as a point of contact by a lot of the students. And this is true from elementary grades right through middle grades and into the high schools that we get to work with. When teachers get feedback about how their students are performing in their arts classes, they become very focused on what they need to do as teachers in order to push those kids that are doing well further and bring those kids that may be not doing quite as well, bring, bring them up. So the arts assessments has kind of empowered teachers um, to be much more focused on what they do. I think that teachers have begun to appreciate what arts integration can do for them uh, as well as for their students. And so there is a, um, a, a growing acceptance of arts integration as an alternative pedagogical strategy to help students learn in the traditional content areas. Because of what we do, the teachers in the classroom end up with a different relationship with those kids. That often the children that are the most difficult, all of a sudden their shoulders go back. They start to exhibit different behaviors and that changes the relationship with the teacher and the classroom and that's what we get from teachers as well. So the kids benefit, the teachers benefit and it just keeps cycling around.